Good morning, friends. How are you? It's great to see you. My name's Ali, and this is Vintage Page Designs, and we talk all about handmade books here. And it's great to see some friends. Hi, Gail Wells. Haven't seen you for a while. Becky and Catherine and Linda and Sandra from France, and Leslie, Carolyn. It's great to see you all here. Um, I'm going to be talking about something today that I get questions about on a weekly basis, and that is how to price handmade books. Although I'll be talking about handmade books, this could apply to any kind of craft, knitting, crochet, sewing, um, artwork of any kind. Um, it could, you know, but we just happen to be talking about handmade books here. Um, but I get asked all the time, and I feel like it's a subject that gets, um, gets people confused but I don't think it needs to be terribly complicated so um, in my mind there are four steps to figuring out what to charge for um, your handmade books so I'm just going to dive straight in and tell you my thoughts if you um, have questions feel free to put them in the chat and then uh, once I've done this quick presentation I will answer any and all questions that I can okay and just before I start, like, why is pricing expect important? And the re there are a couple of reasons. Obviously, you don't want to be losing money when you're pricing something that you are selling. And secondly, you want to feel good about it. I can't tell you how many times I've priced a book or something I've made and I haven't charged enough and I didn't feel good about it. And that's just never a great feeling. You want to feel good about the price that um, you are charging both for you and for the customer. So I think it is important to give it a lot of thought and I don't think it needs to be as complicated as we think. I'm gonna quickly share my screen. Um, where are we? Here we go. So here are the four steps that I think about when I'm pricing a book. Now, before I jump into any of the pricing or what my materials cost, I take a step back and sort of look down, do a 10,000 foot view. And I think about, well, what are my goals here? Because there are tons of different goals that you could have, and we'll talk about those in a minute. So first of all, I think about what my goals are. Then I work with the pricing formula that I have. You may have seen different pricing formulas. I don't think there's any right or wrong. I'll just give you mine. Then step three is we set the price based on the pricing formula and your goals. And then step four is we refine it. So the first price that you come up with probably won't be your final price, so you're gonna refine. So four steps, super straightforward, I promise. So first of all, we're just gonna step backwards a little bit and think about, well, why am I doing this? Why am I, why do I want to sell? whatever it is I am making. Um, and something that I have found happens to me is sometimes I make other people's goals my goals, if that makes sense. Like I'll see someone running a certain type of business, I'm like, oh, I want to do that. But is that really what I want to do? So I think it's important to really know why you're doing what you're doing. So you can see some photos here of like some ideas. Maybe you're doing it just to have fun. And I think that's really fine. Like you can make and sell your books to say friends or people at church and it can just be fun because you really enjoy it. I think that's a really valid reason. You could also do it to um, make money, which is, you know, what we all think of. But that's pretty nuanced because when you say to make money, do we mean I want to replace my full time income and pay my mortgage? Do you mean you want to supplement your monthly paycheck or social security check with another $200 to make life easier? Do you want to save for a vacation? Do you want a new car? Like there's many different money goals. And so, um, and you may think, well, I have lots of money goals. When you're starting out and thinking about this, just pick one for now. So think about, yes, you want to make money. Most of us do if we're thinking about selling our work, but to what end? You're going to go into this with a much different view if you think you want an extra $200 a month versus you want to pay your mortgage. Um, and then another reason might be for um, to make friends, to network and make friends within your local community. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about craft fairs. But I, when I was first starting out, which is much longer ago than I care to admit, I really enjoyed doing craft fairs because I got to meet 
other people like me. Um, and at the time, I didn't actually, that's not the reason I did it. I wasn't that smart. Um, but looking back, that's why I did it. Because I just, I needed to meet people who were doing the same things as me, who liked making things, talking with the customers, talking with other people in my area. That It was a social thing. It was a community thing. So that might be a goal. And I think that's really great. Perhaps you're new to an area and you want to get to know new people. Perhaps you want to get to know the people at the senior center or the library. So you do some kind of um, craft or art show there. So just think that is also a goal. Um, later on, when I was... Um, further along with my business one of my goals was to um, get uh, students for my classes so i would go, go to a local craft fair this time my thought was less about you know community and networking with other makers and more networking with potential students for my classes so when i priced my products i didn't i price them through the lens of um, not making a huge profit, but wanting to engage with um, potential students. So while I was at those shows, I would be making things. I'd be talking to them and encouraging them to, you know, sign up for my newsletter, take my class schedule. And the same is true online, too. You can have an online store, but with the idea that you are also looking for um, students to come into any sort of program that you have. So that is another example of a goal. And um, I suspect that you might have other ones. And so feel free to pop them in the chat because there are tons of different goals that we all have and not everyone is the same. And I do sometimes worry that we make the mistake of thinking that we should have goals the same as other people. Um, let's see. Let's get down to the second step, the pricing formula. So we went, we've set our goals. So you've thought about your goal. I want you to write it down or do some journaling on it. Go for a walk, think about it, think it through. Don't rush in, just, you know, have a think about, well, why am I really doing this? Like, what's what's the point? Um, oh, another goal I, I didn't, forgot to mention is you may have like um, a goal for fundraising. So I saw that little volunteer in the back. You may do this as um, like part of a service project for a nonprofit or for your church, or like I say, for the senior center. It may be that you're looking to raise funds for something. And that I know is a fair, uh, quite a popular one around here, particularly around the holidays. You're actually looking to, um, you know, fund a certain type of project or it just go into the general fund or it's part of, you know, a building fund or something. So that is also another goal, which I, I forgot to mention, which may be pertinent to you. Um, so let's get into this pricing formula. Um, I promise you it's not, it's not, it's really not difficult. Um, I promise you it's really not difficult, this pricing formula. Um, we're going to figure out a wholesale price to start with. That's going to be our base price. And that will be the price, um, the bare minimum price that if you took your wares to a local gift store or gallery, that is what they would pay you. I, we can talk about that in a minute. But this is the, your bare minimum price. And I want you to, when you look at your bare minimum price, include all your cost of materials. So that's packaging, shipping, um, any taxes you had to pay, like sales tax on that book board, that very expensive shipping on the book board, every single little thing that went into that, the glue, the thread, um, even, you know, a new pack of needles, say for every 10 books, you go through one needle. I want you to go through with a fine tooth comb, look around and see um, what you, every little thing that went into making that book to get your cost of materials. Then I want you to, um, pay yourself you've got to include labor you can we can decide later when we refine the price to it, take that out but for now let's add in labor I want you to take the book that you're thinking of um, selling or the series of books or whatever craft it is figure out how long it's going to take you to make it and then multiply that by an hourly wage and I do really encourage you not to do minimum wage only because many of you have been honing your craft for many, many years and have tons of experience. And I don't think you should be paid minimum wage. That's just my opinion. 
So figure out a wage that you feel good, good about. That's not to say that we can't tweak that later, but let's just get our base price of, um, so take, say it takes one hour and you are going to say you're going to pay yourself 25 US dollars an hour. That's still not a ton, but it's better than minimum wage. Um, and then we can also include um, overheads. So you may not ha think you have any overheads, but you may. Um, I mean, an overhead would be studio rent outside, which I know not many people have, but some do. But you also might be renting a storage space to hold all your stuff. Um, you may have booth and table rental fees. Now, you may think, well, I don't know in a, ahead of time what those booth and rental fees are going to be, but you can guesstimate. You can think, so this year I'm going to do four shows, you know, spring, summer, winter, autumn, and generally the fee is $100 per show, so that's 400 over the course of the year. So you're going to include that in your overhead, like split it up per book. I think I'm going to make this many books over the course of the year and split up that booth fee over the year. That's how I used to do it. So I had rent for my studio space. And then I think, OK, I'm going to make 500 books this year. That's just an example. I would divide that out and just have a small amount of overhead for each book. Um, think about office supplies, too, and business cards. All these little things really add up. Um, toner for that printer. Good grief. Um, that's super expensive. So while you won't be adding in like, you know, two or three dollars overhead for printer ink for each book, you might add in 10 cents or 25 cents for the business cards. Like you really do need to sit down and figure out every single thing. And it's a lot scary because sometimes those numbers are quite big. Um, and then profit. And you may be thinking, well, hold on, but isn't profit my labor? No, it's not. For now, we're going to add in profit. You can take it out later if you want to. But even if you are making books for friends, say, and you don't want to charge labor, you just want to charge materials, I would still encourage you to um, include profit because maybe you want to take a class and the profit, you can put the profit aside to pay for a special class you've been wanting to take. Maybe you want to go to, um, what's the place? the John Campbell Folk School or, or, or you know, a, an expensive class you've always wanted to take. Maybe you need a new paper cutter, you know. Um, maybe you want to save up for something specific for the business. You do need some profit for that um, and for any other goals that you have. And also why we include profit in addition to labor. What if your goal was to have a really um, big business and to um, – replace your mortgage, you'd need to make a heck of a lot of books. So you may, may need to hire someone. So then you'd be paying Josie right here, you know, an hourly rate. So that's the labor. So where is there any profit for you? So you do need to include profit to start with. And then, like I say, we can tweak it from there. So step one, really got to spend some time thinking about your goals. Step two, you've really got to spend some time going through um, this list of prices. Let me just um, stop sharing my screen right now because I'm sure you're sick of looking at that. Hold on, stop screen, there we go. I can see there's lots of questions. I know there's gonna be lots of questions today. So step one is you figure out your goal, you spend some time journaling, thinking it through. Step two, you're really gonna go through meticulously to figure out um, what your wholesale price is. And then from there, you're going to take that wholesale price and you're going to multiply it by two or by three to get the retail price. Now, what's the difference between wholesale and retail? Well, the wholesale price is what you would um, take it. So say a local gallery said, we want to buy 10 of your journals, please. You would charge them the wholesale price and then they would charge double or triple to get the retail price and that's their sort of profit. Um, I would encourage you if you're selling on Etsy or selling online not to sell at a wholesale price, sell at a retail price because what if you get discovered by a big company and they want to purchase journals from you for their their website and that, that has happened many times that like Uncommon Goods or something decides that they want your product in their lineup. 
well, if the wholesale price, if you've got the wholesale price on Etsy and then there's no wiggle room and then you, they, they're not going to pay that price you've got on Etsy. They're only going to pay half of that. So you need to sort of plan ahead a little bit for success if you plan to have, you know, a business that you want to, you know, do full time or wherever your goal lies in between. We've all got different goals. So um, there is a big difference between wholesale and um, retail pricing. Personally, um, most places around here do consignment. Um, so uh, by consignment, I mean the, the gallery will say, um, I want 10 journals, but they don't pay you up front for them. Once a customer in that gallery purchases the journal, say it's $50, then they split it with you. So you get 50%, they get 50%, 60, 40, 30, 70. It, it's around, around here, it's about 50, 50. Um, for consignment, I generally um, go a little higher than the retail. So say, you know, it's selling for 50. I might go a little higher because with consignment, things can get damaged. Um, things can just sit there on the shelf for ages and you've got all that stock tied up. So honestly, if I don't do this very much anymore, but if someone does approach me, I generally really push for them to purchase the journals, then it's on them to sell them. And it's not sort of on me to keep popping in and checking. And um, so just keep that in mind when you're pricing for consignment, I would, I would raise the price a little bit. All right, um, let, I'm going to have to go back to share my screen. I'm sorry. I know it's probably boring. Um, here we go. But I just want you to be able to see this. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> um, so your retail price is the wholesale times two or times three. You get to decide. We haven't set our price yet. That's step three. Step two, we're just working out the formula, okay? So let's do an example. Cost of materials for my journal is 10 bucks. I've added everything in. You know it won't be $10, it'll be some you know small number, but I've included the plastic packaging. I've included the business card I pop in there. I've included the cute belly band. I've included the ribbon. I've included the thread. I have included the beeswax, well, that might be going a bit far, but you know, a penny for beeswax. I have included everything in that cost of materials, the paper, and not just, so say I had to buy a big pad of paper and I got four journals out of that, I would divide the cost of that pad of paper by four. Because um, sometimes there's a lot of waste left with those, so just kind of keep that in mind too. Um, my book takes me an hour to make, so it's going to be $25. My overheads are five bucks based on thinking I'm going to make, say, 300 books a year. This is my rent. That's my overhead is five dollars. That includes you know, the electricity for here, includes my P.O. box. It includes everything I have to pay in terms of an overhead, my um, printer ink. And then I include ten dollars profit. And that adds all adds up to a fifty dollar wholesale price. So I'm probably going to sell that retail for one hundred. You can triple it um, to 150, but I'm gonna retail that for say 100. That's the price I'm coming up with. But then step three, well, that, that is the formula price. But step three, hold on, let me just, before we go on to step three, I just want to show you a real life example. And I apologize if this is really small, um, but this is from a spreadsheet of mine um, from my Etsy days, which was, 2014 to, I don't know, 2017, maybe. Um, this is a breakdown of um, everything that went into this little book. I'll show you in a minute the book. And I'll tell you how I came up with designing this book so I could get down to this price. So you can see all the tiny little things, um, including packaging and adhesive. The materials came to 1043. My labor cost I charged at $25 an hour. I'm $20 an hour, beg your pardon. And it only took me 15 minutes per book. We'll talk about that in a minute. My overhead was six. I only put in $3 profit. I'd put in a lot more now, frankly. Um, so my wholesale cost came out to 
24.43. Um, I doubled it to get my retail and then I had to add in my pet, et, Petsy, <laughs> PayPal and Etsy fees. Um, and so the final cost wound up being like 52.55. So I wound up charging $50 for this book on Etsy. Okay, so that's just a real life example. Um, I think that is actually it. Yep, that is it for all my little slides. Um, here's the book. So this is a very simple journal and this would take me 15 minutes to make. So let's talk a little bit about that because um, you might be thinking, well, at this point, my book is gonna cost me $200 to make. I, you know, it's just, there's just no point. But what I want to say to you is now we need to look at that price formula and then go back and look at our goals and then we can tweak it. So if you remember, our cost of materials was $10. Okay, so, and you know, the, the price came out and you're like, I'm a little leery of that price or I really need to make more profit or, you know, there's something about it doesn't seem right. So let's start tweaking the formula. Let's think about cost of materials. Could I make the um, book with different materials? Like, do I have to spend, you know, $10 a sheet for this fancy um, watercolor paper? Is there something else that I could get away with, which is cheaper, but still nice quality? Perhaps you could get yourself some sample books from some different companies, look through them and just figure out some alternatives to more expensive items. I'm not saying you go cheap and nasty, but, you know, do some research and find something that's more cost effective. You could also look into wholesale accounts. People like um, Nina, this example, Nina, um, I don't think they necessarily, you would necessarily get a wholesale account, but if you buy in bulk from them, it's definitely a lot cheaper. The same with Mohawk. I think it's Mohawk Connects. You can buy boxes of their paper and it's a lot less expensive than if you buy it from Dick Blick or, um, you know, a craft store. So think about ways to bring down the cost of your materials, because I think that's an area when you first start out, you're buying everything retail prices. That's definitely an area that you could um, economize on or just bring the price down. Um, Let's think about labor. Um, I'm not suggesting that you change what you pay yourself, but could you simplify the binding or the product so that it takes less time? So that's how I wound up with these books right here. This too used to take me 15 minutes to make. No, it's not particularly fancy. It's got a proper book cover. It's got lovely, oops, got lovely book pages inside, but it, it's spiral bound. So it only took me 15 minutes. A Coptic bound book is much nicer, absolutely. Or a leather bound book, much nicer and takes a lot more time. But if my goal is, so let's look at that through the lens of my goal. If my goal is I really need this business to be profitable because I need to save up $10,000 for a new car, then maybe I really do need to focus on making some money and I don't really mind cranking out these, which are not that much fun, but cranking them out in order to make what I need. Look at it a different way. If you're making books for friends because you just want to make some extra money to purchase a new paper cutter, which is say $1,000, that's, that's a pretty nice paper cutter. You may decide, I don't wanna make books that only take me 15 minutes. I still wanna spend an hour creating that book. So then you just make that decision. Like that's part of the equation that you get to um, you get to change because this is your goal. And there's, so there's no right or wrong. You just decide what is most important to you. Perhaps you won't compromise on the paper you use, but you are willing to compromise on the design. Um, so just think about the different things that you could change. The overhead, do you need that studio space or not? Do you need that storage space? Um, so just look at all those different variables. Um, could you get help um, making the book to make it quicker? So could you get a teenager and pay them less per hour? Uh, could you get your spouse to help you? Are there ways to bring down the, um, the time it takes by sharing the load with someone else? So that formula is not set in stone. I think you should tweak the formula. Um, and then, 
let's see. So I'm going to switch my camera down. And I'm going to go through an exercise, that exercise of um, just showing you how you could tweak that formula. I mean, I'm not sure that you, let's, um, hold on one second. Okay. Let me scooch across. So we had, here was our first book. Ooh, hopefully you can see that. Can you see that okay? Yeah, good. Sorry, if it, hopefully it's clear. Um, so we had our cost of materials, we had our labor, we had our overhead, we had our profit. We came up with a $50 wholesale and a $100 retail. So how about we switch that up and you decide that you are making books for friends. Um, you get your cost of materials down to $7.50 from $10 because you have found a wholesale supplier. And then you figured out that you um, could tweak the design and only do it in half an hour. So half of $25 is $12.50. You decided that, um, I don't know, how could you tweak a design? You could do less rows of stitching. You could um, do an adhesive bound book. You could do a stab binding, which is a heck of a lot quicker. Um, you could do something where you used your Dremel to punch the holes rather than doing it by hand. So you shaved off half an hour. Your overhead stayed the same because unfortunately, it's just that's what it is. You can't change that for now. Um, what did we have for profit? Let's see, we had $10 profit. And you have decided that um, you're only going to make $5 profit. You're like, okay, you know what? Um, I'm making these for my friends. I'm really enjoying it. I think I'll just make $5 profit um, instead of the 10 um, because I'm saving up for this $500 um, class. And I have to sell however many fives into that. Is that 10? No, 20. No, <laughs> I can't do that. 100. <laughs> if I've got $5 profit, I'm going to need to sell 100 books. And I'm good with that. I feel like I can sell 100 books or I've got 100 friends. I certainly haven't got 100 friends. Um, I'm just using this as an example. So then that comes out to be $20, $30. So you can decide, I'm selling that to my friends for $30 and I feel really good about that. Or you can sell it to your local gallery for 60 and you can feel good about that. This is the wholesale, this is the retail. So you get to choose, but what I want you to do is to feel good about it. There's nothing worse than feeling yucky. How about you really need some profit for a car? I'm saving up for this car and honestly, I just, I got to, I got to make some more money. So you've, your materials, do you love my handwriting by the way? My, your materials, we've got them down to 750, which is great. We found a really good source of um, paper and it's good quality, but it's cheaper. You have got your labor down to half an hour and you're still going to pay yourself $25 an hour. Overheads can't change, unfortunately. So that's $5. But you've decided that you really need more profit because you really need to buy that car. So um, you're going to increase your profit to 25. Do you remember originally it was just 10? You've had to increase your profit to 25 now. So this comes out to be 20 plus 30. This comes out to be 50 wholesale. And then you're still going to do it um, 100 retail. So what's changed here? Nothing has changed from this original formula. Well, the end result hasn't changed. It's still 50 wholesale, 100 retail. But what has changed is you've got your material cost down, got your labor cost down, and you've increased your profit because you really need that new Subaru. So that those are the kind of decisions you're going to have to make when you're coming up with your um, formula in step four, um, step three. And then, my friends, final step is step four is to refine. So you're not going to get your price right the first time. The first books I sold on Etsy were $5. $5. Yeah, soon learned my lesson there. 
but you won't get it right first time. And that's okay. Be gentle with yourself. You'll do this, you'll do all this work and you'll get a price and you'll go out there with the price. And then after a while, you'll be like, that's probably not quite the right price. And you can tweak it. Like you can change your mind. And also your goals can change. Your goals can change. This week, you may be doing it because you really want some community. Next week, you might be like, you know what? I'm going to start selling because I really would like to start teaching classes. Then the follow, then, you know, a year's time, you know what? I really want to go a bit further and get some extra income. So your goals can change. Um, and don't be afraid to raise your prices. So I'm going to tell you a story about um, a gal. This is quite a few years ago. I don't even know when, 2019. 2018, you know, before everything, um, a local gallery approached me and she wanted, um, you know, it was quite, a, it was a French link stitch, Coptic stitch book, took quite a long time to make. It was not my qu quick and dirty Etsy books. So I was like, okay, you know, um, all right, I'll do it. Um, it was fairly prestigious, wealthy area. I'm like, it'll, you know, it's good. Um, I put my business cards in there. It'll be great. And when I told her the price, um, her the wholesale price was going to be 25. And that was low, really low. And she would sell them for 50. She was like, absolutely not. I absolutely cannot do that. I can only charge 25. So I had a decision to make. I was like, I'll make no money. I might even lose money. And I did it which I'm not very proud to say, it wasn't, it wasn't a good idea. And guess what? They didn't sell. They didn't sell. So it wasn't consignment. She purchased them from me, but they didn't sell. And she was really disappointed. So I said to her, you know what? If I were you, I'd raise the price. So she doubled the price to 50 and they sold like that. So don't be afraid to raise your prices because there's a, th there's a certain thing called perceived value. And if something is too cheap, too inexpensive. People aren't going to value it. They may think it's too good to be true. You know, you go on Amazon and you see something really cheap. You're like, yeah, no. Japanese screw punch for 10 bucks. It's too good to be true. So um, don't, don't assume by setting your price lower that you're necessarily going to sell more. Every time in my Etsy store that I raise my price, I wound up selling more because of that perceived value. Um, also, when you raise your prices, you, you have to, you don't have to make as much, uh, make as many books. So you can charge a higher price, make more money, you know, cover your costs, make your profit, whatever. And you're making less books, which means you get less burnt out. It saves your hands and your wrists. So please don't undervalue what you do and um, charge what you are worth. So, but always looking at it through the lens of really what is my goal? And your goal alone, not your neighbor's goal, not my goal, not anyone else's. So that's what I have to say on price. I have very strong feelings on price, as you can tell. Um, okay, I think we probably have a lot of questions. Do we, Amber? No, not so many. No. Do you want to um, pop up any questions that we have? And I'd be happy to answer them. So Catherine says, where are we? Uh, my books are made with my own monoprints, which are unique originals. Covers always unique, and I have monoprints. The interiors are made too. So costing is always so tricky. Yep, it's definitely tricky, but you need to factor in the cost of your ink. You need to factor in the cost of every sheet of paper, every sheet of deli paper. It's it's. I guess actually, is it tricky though? Like, really, is it tricky? Um, if you're paying yourself an hourly rate and you've got years of experience making monoprints, make sure that your hourly rate reflects that. Set aside, you know, four hours to do all these monoprints. Okay, that goes into the price of the book. Then, you know, you made 25 monoprints in four hours. I'm just saying. How much ink did you use? How much paper did you use? How much paper towels did you use to clean up? Everything like that. It's just, um, it's diff it can be tricky in the sense that it's kind of time consuming, but um, just add every single thing in, even if each one is unique, that's great. And that can be reflected in the price. So um, I would just, you know, pay attention to all of the steps that go into making your unique books and your unique monoprints and take it from there. And if you have 25 years experience making these monoprints then charge an hourly rate that is 
appropriate to your experience. What else? Different retail prices for different venues. Ooh, my pricing is, so this is Catherine, my price is consistent. It's tricky though, as I live in a rural area, price size, so prices here could be way less than in the city. Yeah, that's true. I used to have that issue as well because um, where my old studio was, it was a sort of old mill town and um, it couldn't tolerate super high prices. Um, so I think you just have to find happy medium. I think you're completely correct in keeping your prices consistent because, I mean, um, local stores, for example, or galleries, they will expect you to um, charge the same price um, on your website, for example, or in your own studio as they charge. Like you can't undercut people. That's just rude. And it's really not the done thing. Um, but I so the way I got around it was I just kind of found a happy medium. I didn't go super low to meet the needs of the sort of the the mill town we're in but I didn't go super high for Boston prices um, so I just kind of met in the middle but it's um it's more art than science you know what I mean it's like you just got to weigh in all these different factors but I think you're really right Catherine in keeping prices consistent <laughs> Oh, Julie, I love this question. How do you get over the fact that each book has a mistake, often unnoticeable others, but I know they are there. None seem perfect. Yeah, you're right. No one knows. Honestly, no one ever knows. Like, we know. And that's like, you look at your book, you're like, oh, I can see all the mistakes. Um, no one knows. And it's handmade and it's unique. And um, how do you get over that? You, Well, you don't because because it shows that you care. And I think it's a good thing that you care and you want to make the best work that you possibly can. But at the end of the day, you have to give yourself a pass and you have to kind of let stuff go and let it be out in the world. Otherwise we'd never put anything out in the world. So give yourself some grace, know that you're doing the best job you possibly can and you have the best of intentions. And um, then yeah, let it go out into the world and live in someone else's life. What else? Diana says, I have trouble separating my labor from the profit. I'm retired and creating for fun. Good. So it seems like getting paid for my labor is profit. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm saying, Diana. You're a great example of your goal is to have fun. And I bet you're making them for, say, you know, friends or perhaps a friend. Someone's got like a and we have a um, shop at our local uh, hospital, like the volunteers stock it with things and it's often made, filled with handmade things, which then are, you know, resold uh, for profits for the volunteers. So that's like a fun thing to do for the people who put their, their um, crafts and artwork in there. So if you're having fun, I think it's fine to not have the profit. I think it's really fine. Or conversely, not charge any labor and include a little bit of profit. So say you want a little bit of profit to, um, you know, upgrade something that you've got, you know, you want to buy a Japanese screw punch or a new one or, or, you know, a Dremel or something. I think it's fine to have a little bit of profit to put towards something that you're saving for. But if you choose not to charge labor, that is okay because your goals are going to be different to someone else who's, you know, 25 and is wanting to run an Etsy store to take over the world. So um, you're perfectly fine. You, you include labor or not, profit or not, based on your preference. What else? Any other questions? Oh, this is an interesting one, Kathy M. What oh, books which have art inside, like an accordion that's full of artwork and took many hours, would need to charge a lot to be worthwhile? Do folks buy them? I Well, yeah, they do buy them. Um, so that would be an artist's book that you're creating. And so... That would be slightly different. So you wouldn't, I mean, you could use the same formula and how many hours did this take me? Or you could look at what other artist books are selling for in your area. So if you wanted to sell an artist book, though, your venue is going to be very different. You're not going to be selling it at um, the local florist or um, I'm, just, I'm just literally because there's a florist next door. That's why I'm saying that. Or a a small sort of store in like a gift shop you're going to be selling those at more like galleries 
And so they're going to have a different pricing structure. They're going to guide you. Um, and then people who come in are going to be expecting to pay higher prices for artist books. They may have collections. There may be buyers from libraries and things. Um, so if you're creating like a true artist book, then the pricing is going to be slightly different. It's going to be sort of more market based on what other collectors are purchasing and the gallery would give you um, sort of guidance on that. But if it was a plain accordion book with nothing inside, then I think you could go towards that formula that I told you and then tweak it for your own goals. Any other questions? Jenny says, curious about working with Etsy. Why are you not using them now or are you? No, I am not. Um, the reason I'm not working with Etsy and I, okay, let me preface this by saying, um, I think personally, I think Etsy is a really great place to get going. It's a great place to start the, um, entry requirements are low. Um, you can just get started, um, really quickly and easily. And so I think Etsy is a really great place to dip your toe in the water. Um, what I found frustrating with Etsy was um, the algorithm, I guess, but that was partly on me. So when you have an Etsy store, you still have to do all of, really you have to do your own marketing. You can't rely on Etsy to send you customers. So um, I went through a phase of just not really being able to, I didn't really have to do any marketing because you know, I sort of figured the system out for all the keywords and the different things, and I was doing great. And then suddenly their algorithm changed, and I wasn't doing great. But that was on me because I didn't do any separate marketing. So, um, so yes, I stepped back. But um, the reason I'm not doing Etsy right now is my focus isn't on selling things. I do have an online store, which I sell some handmade paper and different bookbinding tools. But I just lent um, my whole focus shifted to teaching. Um, and I got fed up of making the spiral bound book, I got to tell you. Um, so um, so right now I'm using Shopify and I do really like it a lot. And I think it's very reasonable. The um, the fee is like $29 a month and um, the, the credit card processing fees are comparable with Etsy. So once you get to a certain level, moving to one of those platforms is a really good idea. But I think Etsy is a great place to start out on. I really do. Um, I know... Some people have strong opinions about, you know, not liking Etsy, but I think you want to dip your toe in the water, it's great. So, be do to do your own marketing. Janice says, how do you find customers or places to sell your work? So if you're looking for local um, stores, florists, galleries, um, a lot of it's legwork. It really is going in, um, it's like Googling and finding, you know, within a certain radius, how far you're willing to drive. It's dropping in, it's making an appointment, it's dropping off samples. Um, if I really feel like the personal touch with local stores and galleries is still really the way to go. And it's not very trendy right now. Everyone wants to be online and do anything by email or text or I don't know, whatever, messenger. Um, but I really feel like the personal touch. So when I was looking to... Um, get into stores and galleries around here, I just made a humongous long list, like a big long spreadsheet. And then I gathered up some samples and I made some appointments and I went in and chatted. And there's there's no um, replacement for that. Just, you know, when you click with someone, that kind of connection with them. Um, and also, um, and another thought around finding places to sell is, and that's sort of more, so those galleries and gift stores are more for like general, products or general books journals but if you are um if you have a, a niche and i i encourage you to find a, like a little niche so my niche was these travel books and selling these travel books to brides so um if you have a little niche it's a lot easier to narrow in on places to sell so if you're making books with a nautical theme or any kind of product with some kind of nautical theme you're going to look to um gift stores in coastal areas, um, East Coast, West Coast, wherever. Um, and maybe you can't visit them all, but you can certainly hop on a Zoom call or talk to them. Um, the more niche your um, 
books are, the further afield you're going to have to go, but it's going to be easier to hone in. So say it's baby books you're making. Maybe you'll be going into, you know, independent kind of baby boutiques and talking with them about that. I used to go into wedding stores and, and or wedding fairs and go talk to people like that. So um, online is a whole different kettle of fish, but if it's in person, it's just kind of a lot of legwork and relationships and asking round and just seeing, you know, what is available locally and going in and introducing yourself. So, I could talk about this all day. Keep going. Any more questions? That's a great question, Juliet. Juliet says, how much inventory makes sense to have before trying to sell? Depends if you're selling online or, you know, in person. So if you were selling it in person to local stores or something, um, they would guide you. You know, you'd go in and you'd show them your samples and they'd say, oh, you know, we'd like five or ten or this would be a good amount. So I'd take your guide from them. Um, online, if you've got an online store, I'd say as much as you possibly can. There's nothing worse than going to an Etsy store and seeing like five things. Like having a full store with all lovely consistent pictures, I think is more appealing. People like more choice. It makes it look more successful, frankly, if there's more things in there. Um, so, but what you can do is um, you can, or, depending on how quickly it takes you to make the book. With with my books, I would make one sample. So say, you know, one with a map of Italy. I'd photograph it, have it up, but then it might have sold. And then when I got the order in, I would make it to, you know, to order. So it wasn't a custom order, but no, but knowing that I can make them pretty quickly, um, you can certainly do it like that. I mean, you don't want to be deceptive and say, oh, that's for sale when it's not. But if you're making the same kind of books over and over again. Um, but I would say have as much inventory as you possibly can. And if you're doing craft shows or anything, more is better just because when things look fuller and they, people look like they've got more choice. Um, but I appreciate that it can be difficult to buy all those supplies and make all those, you know, make all those books, it's time consuming. Um, but as much as possible, I would say. What else? Oh, Catherine, great question. What about packaging? I bore plastic, um, but help, what do you do? Oh, so there's lots of, um, We I work with a company called Eco Enclose. It's spelled E-C-O-E-N, C L O S E Eco Enclose, and um, and there's many others like it, and they do um, sort of environmentally friendly packaging. So they do a lot of brown paper. They do cellophane, which is, I'm told, is biodegradable. Degradable. I just got some samples from them for some like glassine bags and some paper bags, so that um, because we're trying to you know reduce the amount of plastic we use. So they're absolutely alternatives because you do need to wrap up particularly a book or something to keep it clean but there are alternatives to um, plastic as well and if folks have ideas please pop it in the chat um, but just look online for these um, sort of environmentally friendly packaging companies and I think you'd be surprised at the um, the things that they have I will say they're a little bit pricier but you you factor that into your price when you're doing you know um, your pricing formula all right, what else? Anything else? That's a great question. God, you guys got good questions today. Everyone sometimes, everyone sometimes makes the same binding. How to differentiate my work from others and justify the price? Well, that's the million dollar question. How do you make yours different? Um, I would say it's not necessarily the bind, it's probably the covers where you're going to differentiate yourself, don't you think? Um, so making unique covers with either your own artwork or really interesting fabrics, making them around a theme, I think would be fun. I mean, there, frankly, there are only a certain number of book bindings out there. Um, you could make yourself stand out by doing a particularly tricky one or, you know, putting a twist on it or um, well, by twist, I mean, like, you know, say you've got a Coptic stitch book, you know, writing words, sewing words on there instead of doing the straight lines or doing all sorts of different color threads on there to make it stand out. Um, I think there are ways that you can do it. You can, I mean, you could make up your own stitch. 
you know, have a decorative binding and just, you know, create your own stitch. That's how some um, bookmakers have made themselves stand out, you know, a certain pattern of long stitch. You'll see certain sellers and like it's, all, I mean, I don't think they can copyright it, but they, they do their long stitches in a certain pattern that is very unique to them. So I think you can take an existing pattern or sewing style and kind of put your twist on it to differentiate yourself. Um, but that really is the million dollar question, how to make yourself stand out. Um, and maybe think back to what I was saying earlier about like choosing a little niche for yourself. Like um, someone I know was selling books to like um, people who do like medieval fairs, you know, like those um, where they dress up and I don't really know what happens in these things or like steam. They look kind of more like steampunky. That was kind of like her niche. So while she made Coptic bindings or these leather books, which, you know, looked quite simple, the covers and the materials she used were very specific to that niche. So that helped her to stand out. So rather than just doing like a pink floral Coptic bound book, which although beautiful, lots of other people do do. So think about, see if your brain can go down that route. Any other questions? Oh, the second million dollar question. So shipping and handling is figured out separately. Oh, I know. It's a bane of my life, shipping. Honestly, every time you turn around, UPS has raised their rates. Honestly, it's, and do you know what drives me crazy over Christmas? They said we're temporarily raising this rate. And then funnily enough, after Christmas, they're like, oh yeah, you know, that's permanent. So annoying. So um, shipping, yeah, shipping. Mm. I include my packaging costs within the price. And then you've got to make a judgment call on shipping. Are you going to include it and eat the cost? Probably not a smart thing to do. You're just going to, what we do is we charge the straight shipping, whatever, you know, and then if it's charged more, we refund them. Um, or you have to include the shipping in the price and then say it's free shipping. But ultimately, someone has to pay for it. You, the customer, you split it. I mean, I know Etsy really encourages their sellers to offer free shipping, but at the end of the day, someone's got to pay for it. So, um, yes, I do shipping separately, um, and we are thinking about just moving, you know, doing our store at over a certain amount, give free shipping, and then with the with the idea of being we eat that cost um, with a higher order amount. So it's a million-dollar question. It's the billion-dollar question, how to handle shipping. You handle shipping by going to the post office, kicking and screaming at the prices, and then they go lose the package. So, all right, what else? I'm sure that probably wasn't very helpful, but sorry. Oh, <laughs> hello, Miss Nancy. <laughs> oh, am I supposed to say that thing about tax? So Nancy's question is, would you be willing to address tax issues for the small artists? That's tough. I am not. <laughs> you can tell by my um, lovely, you know, calculations. I'm not an accountant or very good at math. Um, I'll tell you how we how we do it. Um, we I charge sales tax within, um, I mean, I, I wonder, I'm not quite sure what tax you mean, Nancy, but, you know, sales tax, you need to pay uh, within your own state. So I have to pay sales tax within Massachusetts. Um, some states want you to collect sales tax. So if you're with a platform like Etsy or Teachable, they'll do the sales tax for you. Some states want you to pay sales tax on products. Some want you to pay sales tax on classes, for the love. Um, so I, in terms of taxes for like sales tax, I would try to find a platform that does it for you. So Etsy does it for you. Shopify does not do it for you, so we have to do it manually. Um, Teachable does it for you. So if you're starting out, I would try and find a platform that does it for you until you get to a certain size. And then if you want to go to one of those other platforms, you can you know, perhaps have your accountant help you figure it out. Um, if you're talking about income taxes, oh, uh, I don't have any advice. Just be honest about what you earn. Just keep all your receipts and... Um, yeah, make sure you deduct everything you possibly can and, uh, yeah, declare everything you make. But, yeah, sorry, I'm not, I can't. <laughs> Taxes are not my forte. That's why we have an accountant and my husband too. Anything else? Any other questions? 
Oh, Laurel, great question. Does anyone have trouble parting with their books? I get emotionally attached. Well, yeah, and that's why I have shelves full of books. I think everyone here gets emotionally attached to their books. Um, yeah, it's difficult. That's why you have to make these kind where you don't get emotionally attached to the got like the ring binding and um, yeah. Yeah, I think everyone has that problem. Um, you know, you just have to, so, so you go back to step number one, you decide what are your goals. Maybe you, um, maybe it's okay you get emotionally attached to those books and then you only give them to people who really mean something to you or maybe you can be emotionally attached to them but still let them go out into the world with those good vibes and think that someone else is enjoying that book. So um, yeah, it's a problem. I, I, I feel your pain. So just think about what your goal is and then that should make it a bit easier. Any other questions? My goodness, there's so many questions today. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Gail. I have 80s hair today. I've got big hair today. I washed it. Thank you. I got it cut finally. <laughs> Any other questions? No, nope, we're good. <sighs> good grief. Um, I am happy to um, answer any other questions. I'm just looking in the chat um, to see if there's any other, some good um, question, uh, good suggestions. Kim uses pirate ship, which is great. Um, Mim said, is this going to be recorded? Yes, it is. Um, and some of it from Catherine, shipping, always tell the Kamasa that you have to add in shipping. Yeah, like I said, someone's got to pay it. Um, I said, there's any other tips in here. Um, Jenny tries to do, uh, tries to work on recycled paper. That could be a selling point. Yeah, absolutely. Recycled paper, recycled packaging. Um, let's see. Here's a quick um, note from Sylvie, price comparison, handmade books versus artwork. I think so, at the same time for labor and materials. I think so. I think your books are a work of art, so I would do the same. Um, Linda's got a good tip for Uline, lots of uh, paper packaging. Yep, I like Uline. The trouble I find with Uline is their shipping is expensive because they're, um, the stuff's so heavy and it's not Uline's fault. It's just, you know, envelopes and everything so heavy that you end up paying so much for shipping. Um, all right. Oh, Linda says clear bags as eco packaging too. I did not know that I use clear bags. All right, just seeing there's any other tips. Uh, I don't think so. Well, I'm sure there are lots of tips. Um, I'm happy to continue to answer questions in the chat, my friends. We are nearly at 15,000 subscribers, which is very exciting. So if you feel so inclined, please hit that subscribe button before you leave because um, it would be fun to say we're at 15,000. And um, that way you'll know when I've got new videos coming up. I will be here next Thursday, which is going to be the 20, is that the 24th? I think it's the 24th of February um, with some more Zentangle. I'm going to try once a month to do some Zentangle. So I have a new Zentangle pattern to share with you. So bring along your notebooks and a black pen and um, we'll do a little drawing together. All right, my friends, thank you for being here today. It was fun talking about price. I could talk all day, but I won't. Um, have a wonderful week and we will see you very soon. Oh, and a big thank you to Amber for being here to help me out with all the questions. I appreciate it. All right, folks, take care. Bye-bye.